Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 15. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released over the last three Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the season finale. We need you in this battle. What more can I say to convince you? Come on, Abu! You cranky old fart! Let me in! I need help! You're beyond help. <sighs> and with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes are... Tegyadair, Aghitrof, Nada, Requirnak, and... Kerbyam Treya. That's how we're going to say them for this <laughs> this time. Agreed. Through. They're perfect. I'm not Lacey Chabert. I do not know how to do this well yet. Uh, for anyone curious, those are uh, Get Ready, Go Forth and Conquer, and Break My Heart, all spelled backwards. The release dates for these episodes were December 16th, 23rd, and 30th of 2021. The in-episode dates were May 14th through 15th, with a heck of a lot of flashback dates that we'll list when we do deep dives. <laughs> the directors were Vinton Huke, uh, Christina Soda, and Christopher Berkeley, and the writers were Nina Chowdhury, Brandon Vietti, and Greg Weissman. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 11 opens with even more flashbacks to Vandal Savage's history with the Lords of Order and Chaos, and after the credits, we cut to present-day Roanoke, where our crew of magicians split off to recruit help in defeating Child, and Zatanna and her protégés head to the Tower of Fate. Z attempts to recruit Dr. Fate's help, but he insists that Tracy, Halid, and Mary aren't ready for this fight and decides to test all three of them places each in a magical simulation where they are forced to confront their deepest fears and insecurities. Tracy's anxiety and fears of inadequacy manifest as a very creepy puppet show. Holland feels like he's both figuratively and literally drowning in his own doubts and the weight of his parents' conflicting expectations for him. And Mary struggles with her younger self telling her that she's useless without her full powers of Shazam and urging her to give in to the temptation to use them despite her addiction to power. Over the course of several flashbacks scattered throughout all that, we see how Vandal Savage, ruling over ancient Babylon, made a deal with Clarion to keep his generals in line, which resulted in Clarion bringing Starro to Earth from deep space. But instead of giving control of his generals to Vandal, Starro simply mind-controlled them for its own purposes, and the ensuing battle resulted in the death of Vandal's son, Nabu. The Lords of Order then decided to elevate Nabu to a Lord of Order and use his helmet as his anchor on the mortal plane, resulting in the creation of Dr. Fate. Back in the present, all three of Zatanna's protégés overcome their tests, Tracy by reminding herself that she faces her insecurities every day and refuses to let her anxiety control her, Halid by taking solace in his Muslim faith and pledging to forge his own path that embraces all of the disparate pieces of his identity, and Mary by remembering why Billy convinced her to quit using the full power of Shazam in the first place, to avoid losing her true self in the process. Despite the young magician's success, fate will... Re <laughs> Sorry, I forgot about that. I forgot because we do get to a point where he does it. I forgot he was just like, yeah, that's cool. I see that you pass all the tests that I had, but I don't actually care. I see that I gave you a pop quiz. You all passed. And you know what? It means nothing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fun fact, this is like whose line, where the points don't matter. Fate still refuses to step in and help defeat Child. It's then revealed that the flashbacks we've been seeing were actually Naboo trying to convince Zatara that there's no need for them to intervene in the current fight. While Zatara insists that cooperation is the only way to maintain order. But before anyone can convince Fate what to do, Clarion shows up on his doorstep asking for help, quickly followed by Child who immediately kills Tikal, banishing Clarion from this mortal plane. Episode 12 then opens with, you guessed it, a flashback. 
this time to a much younger Zatara on the road as a stage magician, saving his audience from a fire and being discovered by Kent Nelson. After the credits, we pick up where last week left off and Child destroys the Tower of Fate. Everyone survives the collapse, though the Helmet of Fate gets damaged. And then, in perhaps the wildest twist of this arc... <laughs> We flash back to that time in season one where Superboy tried to help Superman save a school bus, only for Clarion, in flaming space diamond form, uh, show up and claim the bus as his anchor on the mortal plane, and then begins a road trip through time and space attempting to find a hero who can help him defeat Child. <laughs> we'll get into it. In a different set of flashbacks, we learn how Zatara was inspired by the early exploits of Superman to become a magical crime fighter and was befriended and helped by Kent Nelson. We also learn that Cindella, Zatara's wife and Zatanna's mother, died of cancer only a few years before the start of season one. In the present, our team of magic users begins trying to track down Child, jumping from disaster to disaster around the globe as every available hero and even a few villains attempt to mitigate the damage of this world-ending event. Meanwhile, Clarion is jumping a literal magic school bus through time and space, attempting to find Zatanna and her team at the right point in time to help him defeat Child. If that wasn't enough, in a few more flashbacks, we see how Zatara joined the Justice League, began taking Zatanna on tour with him, inspired new young magic users like Khalid, and eventually took on the role of Dr. Fate to protect his daughter. In the present, Zatanna and her team finally catch up to Child, confronting her in the North Pole, right on the doorstep of the for Fortress of Solitude, no less. But even combining the full force of their collective mystical power is not enough to destroy Flaw or defeat Child. And she traps Dr. Fate in a giant block of ice before escaping. And just when all seems lost, Clarion in the magic school bus <laughs> arrives at the North Pole. Finally, within the Helmet of Fate, we learn that the flashbacks we've been seeing of Zatara were actually a story being told by him to Naboo, so that if he dies in the coming battle, Naboo may pass the knowledge on to Zatanna. And finally, the mid-season finale begins with Vandal Savage approaching the Phantom Stranger to finally put an end to the current chaotic conflict. Back at the North Pole, Dr. Fate frees himself from the ice, and he, Zatanna, and the kid magicians all decide to team up with Clarion despite no one trusting him, and they all head off to find him a new familiar in magic school bus form. I will keep mentioning it because it's amazing. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Phantom Stranger convenes a meeting of the Lords of Order and Chaos, a thing he can just do, apparently so that Vandal Savage can plead his case for why they must intervene to stop Child. In Salem, Clarion gets a new familiar, also named Teekle, and the magic users all return to the Tower of Fate, and Clarion summons Child for a giant magic battle, which starts going poorly pretty quickly. <laughs> Meanwhile, a lot of meanwhiles this one, guys. Meanwhile, Vandal Savage makes his case to the Lords of Chaos and Order, saying that they must join forces now with an eye toward long-term goals, like defeating Darkseid, so as to prevent the existence of both Order and Chaos from being destroyed by the anti-life equation and this, you know, whole convoluted larger power battle that's been going on in the background. Both sides agree to this proposal, and the Chaos Lords agree to no longer lend Child their support, though they will not call her back from Earth, choosing instead to let things play out as they will. At the Tower of Fate, the fight continues, and even without the backing of the Chaos Lords, Child remains a formidable threat. Back in Hollywood, the whole Beast Boy crisis situation that's been unfolding in the background of this whole arc finally comes to a head when Queen Perdita makes a surprise visit to the premiere building where she attempts to offer Gar some empathy and support, but when he pushes her away and refuses to get any sort of help, even after she calls him out for quitting the Outsiders, walking off the set of Space Trek, ignoring her attempts to reach out, and self-medicating with sleep aids, they break up. 
<laughs> and while we're still processing that, the fight with Child continues to escalate, eventually culminating in 13 using her bad luck magic to cause Flaw's one flaw to spread and crack, turning him into rubble, destroying Child's anchor on the material plane and banishing her back to the Chaos Lords. In the aftermath of the fight, Zatanna proposes an idea that Nabu alternate host bodies between herself, Zatara, Tracy, and Halid, allowing Dr. Fate to continue fighting for order while also keeping each host strong and healthy and allowing each of them to live their own lives for the rest of the time. Mary is angry that she isn't included in this plan, being specifically excluded by Zatanna, who believes that Mary is too attracted to power and irresponsible in how she acquires it, just a little, um, (laughs) to be trusted as Dr. Fate's host and leaves via portal. While Naboo agrees to this idea, Zatara is initially resistant, until Zatanna reminds him that she's not the child he tried to save anymore. She's an adult capable of making her own decisions. Halid has his own questions about Zatanna's intentions, but both he and Tracy agree to this plan. And Halid dons the helmet. We then find out that the Vandal Savage parts of this episode were actually a recounting of events told by Phantom Stranger to Naboo and Halid, so they would understand how Child was defeated. And after all that is sorted, we return to the we return to the no longer magic school bus in Salem, where Zatanna makes sure everyone has Dinah Lance's number before Dr. Fate returns the bus to its proper time and place. But just before sending the bus back, Zatanna magically scans the bus to see what what everyone on board went through and inadvertently discovers that Connor's spirit is trapped somewhere and is screaming for help. And just when you think we've wrapped things up for the mid-season finale, there's an after credits scene where Mary sits dejectedly curled up in an alleyway as the voice of Granny Goodness reassures her that her so-called friends and heroes don't actually want what's best for her, eventually convincing Mary to say Shazam and re-embrace her full power set. It's time for some Aster. Indeed it is. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. So jumping into my notes, I it's really nice to see all of the younger magicians in these episodes like finally get some character development and insight. For both Holland and Mary, like we haven't seen them before this season, but like we had Tracy 13 for all of last season, and I, I feel like we didn't really know a thing about her. Yeah. <laughs> and it's nice to get give her the spotlight for a bit. Like all we really knew last season was like Bad luck magic. She thinks Beast Boy's cool. That's about it. Uh, And so getting to have this whole thing where it's like, hi, this is actually a complex character with like complicated motivations and insecurities. I'm like, heck yeah. Heck yeah. Love knowing that. Yep. And we also we also get confirmation of Blue 13. I mean, we had confirmation of that last season. You've just forgotten about it, apparently. Oh, wait, really? Yeah. I So. I had I went back and scanned through some episodes because I was looking for another thing that we will talk about a little later. Uh, but like in the episode where they all go to like the Harvest Festival, oh, you're be- right. uh, Blue Beetle goes, "This is Tracy, my girlfriend." So quick, okay. It's enough. yeah, it's very it's it's part of yeah. the whole episode where Static keeps being like, "Gosh, I feel like a seventh wheel" because like everyone in their group is dating. Okay, that yeah. As soon as you said it, I knew exactly where it had happened. No, oh, shame on me. It's okay. Well, they're still together. Confirmation that Blue Confirmation that they're still together. There you go. Yes, there you go. There you go. And speaking of all those things, I had a thought, and this may be a bit unhinged. It may be me thinking too hard about it, but I'm going to share it with you, and you can tell me if I'm thinking too hard about this. So we have these little, like, tests of everybody's fears and insecurities, and we see them all overcome it. Mary is the only one who, like, overcomes her test because of a metaphorical outside intervention like tracy overcomes her anxieties by her own will and strength and like telling herself like this is how i deal with these problems this is how i reach out for help and like talking about what she does and holids is about like actively choosing his faith and laying out his own life plan that is separate from What either of his parents are insisting he's supposed to do. It's about like his choice. And then Mary's has Billy, an outside voice, just playing this super large part in her whole final speech and victory. And it's less about, it feels at least to me, 
watch rewatching that episode, especially in the hindsight of knowing where Mary ends up by the end of this arc, that I think it's kind of a little bit of a foreshadowing of that because it's not Mary overcoming those things strictly like by herself, quote unquote. It's like her going, what do other people want me to do? And how that falls into like her easily swayed patterns of really just wanting power and how it's a whole complicated thing. And like having other people help you and figure out your stuff and having other people's influence on you help you overcome your problems is not a bad thing. I do not want to make it sound like I'm saying that, but I it feels kind of like a, a foreshadowing setup because it's not that Mary goes no, I don't need you. It's that Mary remembers Billy saying, no, you don't need this, which feels odd in comparison to the others, especially with the hindsight of knowing where she ends up. It feels deliberate. <laughs> and it's just a weird thought. Very much so. I mean, because the thing I think about of uh, the three is that it's almost the, the two are, are facing this internal battle and Mary ends up facing a lot more of an external battle. And that like that's almost like how her powers manifest in a lot of ways, even through the next couple episodes, is that she's pulling in things from outside of herself. Where, and then that's how, like you mentioned, that things go the way they do because of that and like you said it's billy saying yeah you you still shouldn't do that it's still not good for you because of what happens you should still walk this different path but then instead you know it's you know so she's taking the power from you know the the other magicians on team stealing the power from child and literally ripping the power from the earth itself killing like all woodland creatures in in the area yeah and so, yeah, like just finding that power externally rather than internally. And then, um, then old Granny Goodness swooping in. She doesn't follow the rules. She's the only person that gets um, uh, post credit scenes, by the way. <laughs> oh, you're right, you're right. Last season, she got them too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we'll see how that plays. We'll get into that yeah. and crashing the mode yep. a little bit because I feel like our thoughts on where that might be headed are a bit more spoilery. But. This is just something I noticed because I like when uh, Young Justice has cool details like this, but it is a nice touch at the end of this, near the end of this first episode, that when Zatara is talking to Nabu and he recites the Our Father in like the weird pre-echo thing that they do in the Helmet of Fate, the prayer is being recited in Italian, but as in the background, as Zatara is saying it in English. Uh, and I just thought that was cool. If we're yeah. going to do weird, cool sound effects, we might as well make them like really weird and cool. And I like it. Moving on to a different thing, but I said it last time and I'm going to say it again. The fact that Clarion like genuinely cares about Tickle and is devastated by her death and calls her his best friend uh, and genuinely seems to have like a fondness and connection with her makes him weirdly endearing despite, you know, gestures vaguely at several millennia of atrocities. Uh, and I think the fact that Child clearly does not have that relationship with Flaw, that she just kind of views him as a tool rather than a creature that she has a connection with, is part of what makes her so creepy in comparison to him. Like, Clarion is weird and creepy and powerful. Child is deeply creepier and deeply scarier than Clarion. Oh, yeah. And that may just be a we're familiar with Clar the devil you know kind of thing. But I think part of it is that the fact that he cares about his familiar and it's kind of it's a common trope kind of thing of like weird cosmic entity spends enough time on Earth that they get more human than intended. But he's awful. He's a villain. He's chaos incarnate. And I don't want to I don't want to diminish that for a minute and pretend that Clarion's cool. Uh, or nice, but <laughs> he's fallible and emotional and complicated in a way that child isn't. And I think that's part of why seeing both of them face off in these episodes is so fun and interesting. Yeah. Well, and it's also interesting to see like the different interpretation, which is, I mean, kind of what we've commented on from the very beginning. Like just because you're a Lord of chaos doesn't necessarily say a lot. It means chaos, but outside of that, there's don't seem to be much. I mean, and it sounds ridiculous to say, because of course there are no rules when you're a Lord <laughs> of chaos, but yeah, just the difference between the two and just how 
I also think of just like the utter destruction that child is going for makes me kind of even think like that vandal line of like, well, I mean, if everyone is gone and there is just no one on earth, I I don't know how much chaos we have left because there's no one, there's nothing like you're not even, you're not even quote playing the game at that point. Yeah. I kept thinking about that too, especially like the idea that child keeps being like, if you're willing to team up with Dr. Fate, you're just a tool for order. And I'm like, what's more chaotic than teaming up with your arch enemy? Like, yeah. child, I don't f- think you're fully grasping this here kind of thing. And speaking of all this, I would like to to skip around for one second in my notes to say, uh, dear DC merchandising team, I would like a fluffy, huggable Teekle plushie, especially Teekle's mm. new kitten form. Please and thank you. She is adorable. <laughs> and I love her. As someone who is a is a cat person in real life, like I get this cat is supposed to be evil, but I'm sorry. She's adorable. <laughs> she's adorable and I appreciate that Clarion cares about her and supports her that even though she's a kitten, he's gonna bring a magic megaphone so that she can do her big scary meow. Uh, <laughs> my heart. I get it. She's an evil cat, but excuse me, she's cute. Other cool details in these episodes to move past me gushing about how adorable this evil cat is. I think we're all aware at this point that Dr. Fate's voice has always been a combination of Naboo's voice layered over the voice of whoever's wearing a helmet. But something I noticed, especially on rewatching these episodes, is that after the helmet gets cracked in the destruction of the Tower of Fate, a detail that I'm sure will never have any repercussions on this season. I'm sure this will never come back. After the helmet cracks, uh, Zatara's voice becomes much louder in that sound mix and is even like slightly out of sync with Naboo's and even overpowering his voice sometimes. And we'll see what that means uh, at some point, I'm sure. But it's it was just an interesting detail. Like I've been loving how they've been using sound mixing to hint at things this season in really interesting ways yeah i mean we've i mean I, i've met them personally and we've had them on the show but di- dynamic music partners i mean again i've said it before as well as like they have a, like closets full of awards as to why they are fantastic at what they do um, but the other one i thought of is is there also like an element of like releasing some of that control that Nabu has always had? So like that voice gets to be more in the forefront because they actually, I don't know, have some agency in this process rather than just being a husk that Nabu carries around um, <laughs> to do the bidding of the Lords of Order. So that, that was another thought I had. Uh, and certainly it being broken, does that get fixed? Like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how all that plays out. Eventually, I'm sure. (laughs) A much, much sillier side note for a moment. As everyone knows, my notes are in chronological order, not order of vibe. So I just want to point out that on the set of Space Trek, the Clamulon character that takes over Gar's role as captain is named Lieutenant Der Chow. He's a space clam named Chowder. And because I have to know that, everyone has to know that. And everyone has to sit with that pun. Which is amazing. And it's also, I mean, the whole, that whole scenario is like a bit of a like play on, I mean, well, okay. All of Space Trek has its own like hints back at the greater Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. Because that it it mimics kind of like Worf becoming the engineer who's like this, you know, like one of the, the, the alien species that they're against, but now he's on the ship. Also, my favorite piece of this is seeing them do the bridge motion reactions because you have to, because like, Oh no, the ship's being rocked, but like you can't rock an entire set piece. That's not how it works. So you have to have all the actors act as if they are being (laughs) rocked. And it is probably one of my favorite, like subtle nods uh, in the whole, in the whole episode. Yep. (laughs) Oh, it's so good. It's an adventure. I've had to do things like that for stage acting stuff and it's always an adventure (laughs) on a more serious note because again all i do is jump around here i I get these episodes have a lot of flashbacks and i again wish we could have some semblance of time stamps on just some of the like yeah. close to pre-season one flashbacks like i don't need an exact date for the sinking of atlantis or the events in ancient babylon 
But 7,568 years later. <laughs> but like, it would be nice for context to know like how recently Zatara joined the Justice League or when Zatanna lost her mother. Cause I feel like in the same way that like knowing how we talked about, like knowing how long it took for Jade to come back to Artemis for help after running away would add emotional context to that storyline. I feel like having some dates on the Zatara flashbacks would be equally helpful. Because there's some guesses we can make based on like what design they used for Zatara for <sighs> when they have such similar names. Like there's some guesses we can make based on like what designs they used for Zatanna and how she looks relatively close to the way that she looks at the very beginning of season one and how that means that that was probably relatively recently but was it recently in terms of a couple of years or five years or months i don't think it would be months uh but like it raises questions and i i have them and i want to know i want to be able to piece together a more complete timeline because it's just just for emotional context reasons. Like, I don't need the deep lore. I just want to know <laughs> how long it's taken things to happen. Also, related to this, I did some math while rewatching the episodes because I started thinking too much about this. And so Zatara says that he was 28 the first time that he saved his audience. And then, and Zatanna was two. An unspecified amount of time later, but what appears to be like only weeks, maybe months, based on just the vibe of how that said, he started doing real crime fighting. At least that's how I was reading it as weeks yeah. to months, not years. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Zatanna is 14 in season one. So Zatara's been a superhero for about 12 years at the start of season one. I, when did he start training Zatanna? When did he join the league? When did these things? I have I have so many uh, questions. Yep. I'm just so curious. I want to know. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm an I'm an absolute nerd, but only for the emotional context of the timeline. <laughs> Listen, it's not that I need to know all of the information forever, but like I need to know how much I need to cry about things. Uh, <laughs> yes, we we've talked about it before. Where like you, you can use Team Year Zero as a, a a point of reference, and it has been used in time codes before. Uh, but once you go before it, it just does yeah turn into something very weird. It's like, can we get like pre Team Year? Like, is that how we have to start labeling things? What does it have yes. to be? Because I get it. We don't want to place this as a specific like real world year for reasons, but like also. <laughs> I want to know. And on a less Emily thinks too hard about math note, having every super powered person that they can get on call going to international disasters as quickly as Madame Xanadu can predict them via magical tarot cards is heckin' amazing. And I love it. I just love that. I like that whole bit of this episode is so fast and so much happens so quickly. And at the same time, I'm just like, this is amazing. I love this entire concept. Yeah. I think you had, didn't you have some thoughts on some of the stuff that we saw in that whole breakdown of stuff? Well, it was just interesting to see like who, who was already in yeah. places and then like conceptually, like we've, you know, we can look at previous seasons of are they at this point, are they just using magic? Are they using Zeta tubes? Are they using, who knows what they're using? But the fact that like team magician shows up and like red tornado is already there helping people. And so is stranger. And so is like stranger moving them. Like th that's another mo mobility option. Uh, but it was a really big fan of. Team Wonder, I don't know what else to call them, but it was Wonder Woman, the Wonder, Wonder Gals. Girl, and then you know, the Wonder Gals and Troya. <laughs> um, also, Team Demon was super fun. <laughs> also, like why I had so many questions when we got there because it's like I do understand that we're using a more arcane version of um, Blue Devil, and then you have Etrigan, but like why were there demons coming out of the one in Sydney? Because they were certainly coming out there. Like I don't understand what was different about this one. It's like, did Etrigan bring them? Were they here to yeah. help or were they here to cause more problems? What are we doing? Yeah. Yeah. I was very confused. <laughs> and like, I wanted to know the other places. Um, also, then we, we go and then um, a, a subtle nod from all the way back in season one, episode one, scene one, if you will. Phil Barassa gets frozen by um, Mr. Freeze. 
Um, he is frozen, and he is frozen again in this episode. <laughs> Um, and in the end credit scenes, thankfully, don't worry. I assume that he didn't die in the first one and he didn't die yet because you, he, in the end credit scenes, he's the one to the far left sitting there in a blanket. Nice. Um, so very nice catch. No, he, he got saved in Gotham and was like, I'm moving yeah. halfway around the world. So this never happens again. It'll and be fine. then <laughs> little thing. I really wish, I know we've talked about this before, but I wish that Zatanna and Zatara's spells were transcribed in the closed captioning so that I could like figure out what they were without having to sit there and repeatedly listen to the audio to try and piece together something. But yeah, there is a there's a whole bit with Zatara speaking Italian and like I would love to just be able to go translate that not based on sound but just based on actually having those words in front of me. And just, I don't, I know that it's more work and like from a general standpoint, it's like, oh, we'll just say that it speaks another language or does, it casts magic spell and it shouldn't matter. And I get that it doesn't yeah. really matter. I get the vibe. I get the context. I see what the spell does. I and I understand. But also, I just want to know for my own curiosity I am insatiably curious, and I would like to know who's casting magic spells. Yeah, and the, yeah, and then we had the the context of just like, oh no, don't worry, it's ancient Greek, it's Arabic, it's Latin, it's all mixed together, and it's like, oh, well, at least the backward stuff I can I can start to re- like. I, I yep. want to say reverse engineer it, but I mean, is it forward engineer it at that point? And even then, <laughs> it doesn't. It would oh no work perfectly. Because you can't just reverse that audio since it's written out and spoken out as it's written instead of just reversing the audio. Yes, as you uh, can tell, as you can tell from the episode title on HBO Max for episode twelve, <laughs> we're just leaving that. Maybe it'll be fixed by the time that this podcast comes out. One can only hope. Shifting gears again, uh, in a show with ten million characters. Queen Perdita is once again easily my favorite minor character on this show. Like season three made me absolutely love this girl. And this one episode continues to make me be like, yes, you are incredible. Uh, and I is- <laughs> I want to be Queen Perdita when I grow up. Like, <laughs> So thoughts on Queen Perdita very quickly, as quickly as I can say them here. Uh, she is one actively reaching out and showing up for Beast Boy after several episodes of me shouting at everyone on screen to try and help this kid. 9,000 uh, kilometers of actively reaching out. 9,000 yes. kilometers of actively showing up for her boyfriend. She offers sympathy, empathy, and like someone to lean on and talk to who actually understands because I feel like we all kind of forget that Queen Perdita lost her parents at a very young age and that's why she is the literal queen of a made-up country. She also then she explicitly calls Beast Boy out on his self-destructive behavior, which everybody has kind of been tiptoeing around to the point of inaction in some ways. Like Stargirl tries and fails in the previous episode. But like having I appreciate that we have Perdita being both like genuinely emotional support, giving very good girlfriend and also knowing that part of being a good person to the people you love is calling them out when they are doing something that is going to hurt and destroy them. Uh, And not only urging him to get help, but offering to help him if he'll let her and like, not just saying you need help, but saying, how can I help you? And ultimately setting her own boundaries by the end of that scene, because Beast Boy is honestly not treating her very well. And I understand that it is it is realistic on all sides. Like some people would be like, I'm sh- I'm sure some people watching this are like, why are they dragging this out so long? Why is Beast Boy still going through all of this? Why is he acting so mean to everybody? And it's like, sometimes that is what grief and mourning and depression look like. And this is being realistic and complicated and showing all of the complicated layers of that. And I appreciate it. And I also just really appreciate Queen Perdita as a character. Mm. She's my favorite minor character on the show. She's only in like four episodes total in this series. And I'm still over in the corner being like Queen Perdita fan club for life, man. Yep. (laughs) And this is also a very tiny detail, seemingly tiny detail that I love about Perdita showing up in this season is that 
Perdita's design, her character design, now has a visible scar from her heart surgery in season one. And I love that. Like you, I went back and checked because I was like, "Did I miss this last season?" Mm-hmm. And you I, did I didn't. She does. She either she doesn't have it in previous seasons, and you can chalk that up to like different clothing choices if you want to. But I just think it's a nice bit of redesigning between seasons that works beautifully for me. Of people kind of remembering, wait, this girl had open heart surgery and a heart transplant when she was like nine. You would have yeah. a scar from that, and it's. Amazing. Like the new character, the new lead character designer is Dao Hong for this season. And I'm assuming that they're responsible for this one. But shout out to whoever it might have been because it's a decision that I love. I love it. Like the second she walked on screen, I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it's very great to have little character design choices that can like weirdly like make me so excited or seeing like, of course, of course, this is right. And why was why didn't I realize that this was missing the last time I saw you? Kind of thing. Yeah, the the intentionality of it because you can easily just forego having it visible. You just put, you know, a, a high collared shirt on, and then it's never seen. Um, but like all the implications that can come from it as well. The idea that um, Perdita is just you know, comfortable enough in her own skin that like, that's the thing that you see. And that, that just is what it is for her. Um, but then, yeah, again, that intentionality that has to go through so many hands, um, you know, storyboard artists and animation and you know, that all of that is involved to say, yes, this is what we want to see on screen. Yeah. So I agree. It's one line. It is literally one line in a character design and yet it, it means something and I like it. I appreciate that it's there. Moving on to a larger thing from this arc, uh, Clarion the Magic School Bus is amazing. I love it. That entire sequence of just, and just the fact that we have spent uh, three and a half seasons going, haha, there's one bus in Young Justice and it's always in danger. This is a funny reused gag, only to find out, no. This was planned. And any other show, I'd go, it's, this is a really fun, like, retroactive continuity bit of like, look, we took the gag and turned it into a real thing. And then seeing Greg Weissman answer questions on Twitter and go, no, you know how we've said before that we had five seasons planned while we were writing season one? This was part of that. Uh, We had planned this. And a lot of other shows, I might not believe that, but on Young Justice, the show made up of 10 million flashcards duct taped mm-hmm. to walls. Uh, I believe it. And it's wild. Yeah. Every every single thing about the bus is something else because, wow, man, the implications and the timey-wimeyness of it. I mean, I guess in a lot of ways, like... Dinah sees it more throughout, but then also like could give more credit and also understand and also say like, maybe we don't need to look into it yet. Um, But the like back and forth of that, because when you go backwards, the first time it happens, she already knows because they've contacted her. So every subsequent time that she interacts with that bus, she kind of knows what's happening, but can't really say anything. Yep. I like, Literally, this it's one of those things where Young Just this season keeps doing things like little minor things and arcs that make me go, now I gotta rewatch the whole series and keep an eye out for this thing, whatever well the thing is. Like, which is amazing. And I love shows that can make you do that, but is also like, God, now I have to have three separate rewatches planned, all focusing on different characters. <laughs> oh yeah. But yeah, no, that entire that all of the credit scenes this season are amazing, and I feel like we haven't talked about them as much as some things because there's just so much going on. But like having the idea that Z- that Dinah has known about this bus for ten years, could not say anything to anyone, uh, knew about stuff with Zatanna for ten years and couldn't say anything about that for a while, just knew some things and went, "We're gonna have to just put that in a box." And not tell anybody for a while kind of thing 
is just amazing and wild and I love it. And the fact that Diana has been so wonderfully set up as just the great character that she is just makes me just immediately go, yeah, no, I'd trust, I'd trust Black Canary to somehow keep uh, world altering secrets for 10 years uh, without a problem. Yeah. Con- confidentiality. Come on now. She's just good at it. She's very good at her job. And just the fact that like, when we get into deep dives, I'm sure we will be breaking down like all of those scenes and going into stuff. But stuff like there is the moment that is all of them just flying through space and screaming. The fact that the timestamp just pops up as question mark, question mark, question mark, uh-huh. dash, question mark. Like I laughed out loud at the time oh, yeah. stamp for that because it's just like, we don't know. Clarion's doing something um, just why it's amazing. Yeah. I love it. Uh, all of that is wonderful and it all culminates in them somehow finding the spookiest animal shelter in all of (laughs) salem massachusetts that is somehow open during the end of the world and surrounded by dead trees in the middle of may across from a graveyard because of course that's where clarion goes to get a cat gave me some serious pet cemetery vibes (laughs) so now my notes are getting into the end of the the mid-season finale because there's a lot to cover in the end of the mid-season finale and we're gonna get into it real uh, i'm gonna just start saying this and you tell me if if i'm wrong feel free to tell me if i'm wrong okay so real thing here for a moment when Khalid confronts zatanna about like the what she's doing and whether or not this is a good thing he says you let mary do what she did only to penalize her for it later and rewatching that scene especially, I'm like, how in the world did Zatanna let Mary do what she did? Because that reads as him saying, like, you let Mary steal our powers and steal and t- kill a forest in all Ooh. of this stuff. And I'm like, like, during that fight, Tracy also says something like, Zatanna, you have to stop her. But Zatanna had already made it very clear that she needed to focus on keeping the shield up so they didn't all die of fire rain. So what was she supposed to do? Was she just supposed to stop everything and go, hey, stop that teenage girl drunk on cosmic power? Like, what was, was did, were they expecting Zatanna to tackle Mary to the ground and be like, no, stop. That's not how we magic right now. And I well, feel yeah, like, was she supposed to throw a rock instead of flaw? Like what? <laughs> like the one thing that I think, like if we we're going larger picture on it, what Holly may have meant was like, well, you encouraged her to steal child's power and to channel that power. And then she did the exact same thing to us and you're getting mad at her about it and telling her that she's not allowed. And I'm like, okay, but yeah. Yeah, she's an uh, she's an older teen. She can understand that some things are okay sometimes and not other times. Maybe that gave me flashbacks to the early season one, where it's like, no, McGain, this is when you can go into brains, and this is when you can't go into brains. <laughs> yeah, and how that it, it, it yeah, it's a complicated line to walk. And how do we teach people with enormous cosmic power uh, morals and everything? But it's like if everyone is standing there and, and like. Everyone on that team stood there and got behind Mary siphoning off child's power. And everyone let her do that. Nobody stepped in then and said, hey, Zatanna, maybe don't let her do this. Everyone's going along with it. And then Mary does the wrong thing and uh, tries to steal the power of her friends and drain all of the power from the entire area because she has her own issues. And I'm not saying it's like... Mary clearly has like an addictive personality and she is drawn to power. And that is a complicated thing that she needs to work and figure out and decide the best way to move forward with that if she wants to be a hero. And I think there are ways that Mary could like redeem herself, quote unquote, and move towards being a hero in the right way. But they're complicated. Like, I don't think she is an irredeemable person just because of what she did. But like, it felt weird watching someone blame Zatanna for the way that Mary acted. Yeah. Like I was like, that's I'm like, I'm not saying that Zatanna's choice here is perfect, but that one's not really her fault. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, and when they're in the North pole, all, I mean, the whole process happened intentionally, you know, they were giving their power 
to marry to then give to Naboo to then adm- administer. They were all um, actually they were all giving their power to Zatanna to give to Naboo. Zatanna's oh, that's what the it was. focal point. Oh, okay, Naboo. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, like, they, they're showing that transference of power and things like that. The other thing that's also interesting is, like, I don't see it as a penalty to not be beholden to be fate for a week. And that's um, what Zatanna tries to tell her. She's just like, yeah. you're just not ready for that thing. And I get that. No, sorry, I'm cutting you off because I'm so. Oh, I no, have no, you so many well, thoughts on this. Just Go the ahead. idea that, that um, I mean, I think. Holland's view of it is so different because he grew up with the Nelson family and calling her aunt and calling him uncle and seeing this as like, you know, kind of that, um, the, you know, going to the prestidigitation line that gets used multiple times. But the idea like this was a path that he could see for himself. Like this isn't, this means so much more. And he even infers that about Tracy, like her not understanding what this is. But I think that's the same thing is having Mary do that then is okay but that doesn't mean her becoming one of what i call the rotating fates my new (laughs) band name like that's not something that works her doing that in that moment because you're literally fighting a lord of chaos who's being backed by all the other lords different things need to happen but again that she cannot be one of the rotating fates i can because i just she'll never take it off like there's no way there's been a there's but I've seen a lot of talk in all directions about whether or not what Zatanna did in all of these episodes was quote unquote like the right thing to do and how like she tries to tell Mary like you can't be Dr. Fate and it just upsets Mary because she maybe doesn't say it in the perfect way and she says it in a way that like would set a lot of people off and be like what are you saying about me kind of thing and how her plan is like I want my dad back, so all of us have to do this thing that's not great. Um, And it's something that, like, hopefully we'll see how this unfolds and what this plan means and how I think it's an interesting solution to the current problem at hand. But I think some people are kind of ignoring all of the gray nuances of this decision. Like, yes, sure, the perfect self-sacrificing heroic move would have been for Zatanna to sacrifice herself to free her father or take on the helmet of fate so that her dad can live and whatever. But Zatanna's not perfect. We are all of us selfish people sometimes, and that's okay. Like, they are presenting Zatanna as a complicated human whose goal was not just, I want my father not to be Dr. Fate anymore, but her goal was, I want to be able to interact with my father again for more than an hour a year. Like that was her goal. And that was what she was trying to get to. And I think that that is a fair and understandable and complicated thing. And yeah, I feel like some people wanted her to just be perfect in this whole arc. And she never was going to be. And I think trying to expect that of her or of any character is not a great way to approach a story (laughs) in some ways yeah and there's there's a i mean there are far more wrong versions (laughs) that she could have gone down one i also think of like from her perspective or my interpretation of her perspective let's start there because we're just two people talking on the internet yes of course but but how would her taking it not ultimately hurt her father more than any other choice she could possibly make? Also, there's the version where she is, I mean, wrong and a total jerk of just letting Holland take it. And then neither her nor her dad have to do it ever again. But what instead happens is that she has to do it. Her dad still has to do it. And she found two people that are willingly accepting to join and convinced Nabu as well, which I still feel like Zatara did a really good job along our way to convince Nabu of taking it, even though he himself, you know, he convinced Nabu to be like, you should totally listen to my daughter. Wait, no, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait please don't listen to her about this, though. All the yeah. other things are totally fine, but please don't listen to her on this one very specific topic. But like, I think given the circumstances that she did the best that she could with what the pieces that she had. Um, yeah. And I know we talked before recording the, the, the questions that are asked of her, like, did you 
basically, did you groom us to become this? And I really don't think that that's what happened. Just based on what Phantom Stranger says, the look that she had in the first episode of this arc and the referencing that being like the catalyst for all of this happening is her realizing like this new situation with fate. And is that what they were referencing when they, they talked about it? The um, new, I don't know, maybe I'm blowing my own mind with this, but the idea of like this new negotiation that they had from the other side, you know, like chaos is talking about what order is now doing, but giving the timey whiminess and like, we see a whole year into the future while the bus is going around. Shh, do we'll they get realize? To that. <laughs> hey, I don't know. Mention that's that all one. I said. That's crashing the mode. <laughs> No, no, that's in, but that's in the. I know. Geez, it says one year we'll later. Get, we'll get we're there. not. We're talking. But is <laughs> is that what was being referenced? Was this new way of approaching Lords of Order? Because before it's just Naboo and Kent Nelson just put that thing on a shelf forever. But now you have people that are actively working as a team to make it better for all parties involved. Yeah, and it's gonna. We'll see how all of that plays out. And I'm going to have to do a rewatch of this season. I'm going to have to do mm-hmm. rewatches of previous yes. seasons. All of it's going to fit into place eventually. But like, yeah, I agree with you. I feel like some people were under the impression, like Holland asks that question. It's like, did you plan this? And Zatanna doesn't answer. And I think some people took that as, for some reason, confirmation of like, oh my God, Zatanna was always planning this. But I have absolutely not read it that way. To me, the impression that I got watching these episodes is that that moment in episode nine, when she stops mid-sentence, is the first time that this occurs to her of like, wait, this could be a viable option. And it just gets that stuck in her brain and she can't let it go. But also there is not enough time for her to like come up with a genuine solid plan to like really present to people. So when it comes up, it's just this kind of, cobbled together like here's what i'm thinking (laughs) and everybody just runs with it as she says it like she has only had this plan for a day and a half or whatever and it's just it's a it's a thing i don't think that she was planning this from the moment that she got proteges i don't think that that is i think she may have always been planning of like maybe taking on proteges and training with other people will lead to figuring out a way to fix this like having more magical minds working together and like the fact that she knows multiple other magicians throughout the entire yeah. international wizarding community, magic community, whatever we call it in Young Justice. Like I think Zatanna has probably always been doing research into how do I save my dad, but I don't think this specific plan occurred to her until no. the moment it did. Um, And that's, okay and it's complicated and we'll see how it plays out and what it means and how this is approached but like i do not think that this is the evil horrible decision that some people have tried to frame it as or say no. that it is i think especially because it's she did not force anyone into this Holid willingly agreed to this tracy willingly agreed to this even after zatanna lays out like hey you don't have to do this. And I am telling you actively, you do not have to do this. And some people might say like, yeah, but Tracy has anxiety and she wants to please her mentor. And I'm like, sure, but this is still a decision Tracy is making. Yeah. Which, I mean, you see, I mean, you see more of that agency, even in like the test from Dr. Fate, as well as Holland saying, I'm going to take the helmet first. Cause you got to check with your dad before this is an okay scenario that we all find ourselves in. And it's a whole thing. We'll see how it, We'll see how it unfolds. But on a lighter note, in relation to this, because this is a whole complicated plan and I look forward to seeing what it means, but I just, I need to, these are two things that I can't get out of my brain that must be shared. One, Zatanna is going to spend one week every month relentlessly sassing Naboo and I am 100% here for it. We have seen only a couple of scenes of her interacting with Nabu as an adult, but Zatanna does not like this cosmic entity. She has never liked this cosmic entity, and she will use her time to ruin his day. <laughs> and I'm here for it. Yes. Zatanna stuck with Nabu is just going to be like, why are you making this decision? Why are we doing this? Do you just sit here and meditate all day? Is that all we do? 
Is this what you did for 10 years? Really? He's like, he's like, uh, just, he's like just take it off and put it on the shelf. It's fine. I will. I'll get it. I'll, I'll save this, this world saving for next week. I, I yeah. Can't. It is the, it is the question that I have asked multiple times watching these episodes where I'm like, what does Dr. Fate do the six days out of seven that there is not a crisis happening that he feels like he needs to step into? Because Dr. Fate doesn't step into a lot of crises. He just waits for one that he goes, ah, oh, this is a big enough one for me to deal with. And then goes into, I'm like, what do you do with the rest of your time? You don't have I, a day job. So I've wondered, I've wondered that for, you know, several characters, the same kind of question is, okay, so, you know, we're very earth earth 16 focused in the things that we see on screen so does like dr fate go deal with something somewhere else because you know when we talk about the lords of chaos and order we talk about 16 billion years ago when this universe came into being like is fate dealing with something like somewhere else like i maybe i don't know because i agree because if not just hanging out in the tower just doing nothing yep but the other thing being that this plan does raise some questions like how is Holland going to complete medical school if he keeps having to miss one week of his life every four weeks oh, yeah. uh because especially after we've just had an episode where Holland insists like i'm going to be a doctor and a superhero and i'm gonna do both of these things and i'm like okay that's a lot to to do at once but i feel like you could do it now he's taken on the most complicated uh part-time job in the world that's going to eat up a week of his life every month and i'm like how do mm -hmm. how are you going to do it now i personally think they need to set up a shared google calendar and just trade shifts based on who has what important life's going on at any life events going on at any given time just sometimes maybe sometimes Zatanna does like two weeks in a row because tracy has to like go to a school thing and stuff like that hey where's the where's the helmet at who left it oh no you didn't check the doc. <laughs> I love it. Uh, it's like sometimes it's like sometimes it's seven days. Sometimes you do eight days just because, you know, like Holland had an important test he had to go to. Like, it's fine. <laughs> like, that's the that's the best way that I feel like we could have dealt with that. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see how we handle this thing. This is its own tie inside comic. That's just the ongoing events, uh, the ongoing adventures of these four people trading the helmet. So finally, last but certainly not least thing from these episodes. So Connor's somewhere. We'll share some thoughts and crashing the mode. But yep, Connor, Connor's somewhere. It was very it was kind of funny watching this episode after weeks and weeks of me being like, we we definitely haven't seen the last of Connor. Just weeks of me saying this to anyone who will listen, and then it happened, and me still being like, "Ha ha!" As if this is some new revelation. When I've been over here sitting in my corner, being like, "He's not dead," for weeks, only for it to happen, and I'm just like, "Wait, <laughs> why am I why am I freaking out? I knew this would happen." Except you never know. You never know for sure. But there's Connor. This is good. We'll share more thoughts in crashing the mode. But for now. Hey, look, it's Connor. Let's go save hey. him. Hey. Get in, losers. We're saving Connor, but it's baby Bioship this time. Yes. So that leads us to anything I have left over. And I'm wondering. Yes, so, please, Neil. Share okay, your thoughts. Okay. Uh, mine, mine are historically more ridiculous than yours. That's just <laughs> the fact of the matter. One of the things that always weirds me out is like that Clarion is in the suit that he's in, but he's in like ancient Babylonian times. And then just like. It just, he's chaotic. It, I know it throws me off a little every time. Like, no respect it, it, for time or historical no. accuracy. Clarion is here to be weird and anachronistic always. Yes. Yeah. It it, it, mm -hmm. it hurts my brain. Obviously, we can see a lot more to the nods now that we have the whole arc. But like you said, we can kind of get into those later. The one that I do like is that like the whole Starro thing, like it's interesting that it's Clarion's not fault. I don't know. I don't want to put fault on Clarion. That gives him too much credit. But the, like <laughs> that Clarion brings Starro, but like that that is still an active piece of the plan when it comes to the light. Like Starro and bits yeah. of Starro were still being used 
you know, in the seasons that we're watching, like the idea that that's just been around since ancient Babylonian times. And then he just got frustrated and just like put it on ice, but is still leveraging that is really, really cool to me that like those things, you know, everything that we're seeing in these times before are still things that, you know, Vandal has the long term plans, you know, rather than like a year from now, it's 5000 years from now that he's like, oh, you know what, maybe I'll use that star thing um, again when I get around to it. Um, the other speaking of centuries long, the, the one line that really is stuck that I'm stuck on is Dr. Fate quote, who has for centuries defended this world. Wait, what? Um, every yeah. time you show me it's Kent is the first person or, or like the earliest iteration of Dr. Fate from what we see. And then, you know, the team passed it around <laughs> like, like it was nothing, but Wait, well, like huh? it was something, but no, not yeah. maybe with as much as much serious reverence as they yes. should have given it. Yeah, um, but so then who? Uh, okay, I, I mean I I'm not you. gonna know, but like it just stuck, just got in my brain of just like, wait, who are all these other fates? And like seeing it, it's like seeing it that first that that like flashback of all of them in the lot, la- like that moment where they all appear in the yeah the fate, like what I like. In a perfect world, in a perfect world, I feel like we would have gotten like that moment in Avatar The Last Airbender. Like people know what I'm talking where the one of the moments where like Aang first like communes with his past lives and they just stretch in an endless line off into the distance. And it's like Mm -hmm. the only ones that you really see are like those first like five, six that we see in flashbacks throughout all of Avatar. But like there is the impression of hundreds And, like, I feel like, like, I wish we could have had that. And I get that there are, like, there are budgetary constraints and, like, we do not have the time and resources to always just, hey, design 15 other people who have worn the Helmet of Fate and just put them there for this one shot. Like, I'm Mm -hmm. never going to demand that of a show when I know that there are, you know, all the constraints we have on this, especially... In Young Justice, where every single one of those would have to be a canon character from oh, the yeah. comics and we'd have to track them all down. I get that. But like, I wish I wish like that's like that moment just kept reminding me of that scene in Avatar where I'm like, where's the 10,000 other avatars before <laughs> Kent Nelson? Yes, yes. So there are a few pieces that surprised me um which is good certainly good um the escalation of ch- child's um plan and just killing teagle i did not see that coming i really was like oh they're gonna duke it out and then the people in the side of tower of fate are gonna come out oh no okay um i have never just- screamed oh my god don't kill that cat so loud at my television yeah. before i don't think i've ever screamed that phrase at my television before period but like it was pretty loud this time i was like no, 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 don't, don't, don't do this. Well, and part of it is that I, and I've had some discussions about this before now, but it's almost interesting that the escalation almost was so far that the defeat of child was always going to not hit all the way because like, I don't know what you do once you're literally having like demon filled volcanoes popping up around the world and just like you murder, you murder this cat, send another Lord of chaos off into the ether. Um, So it, it still was very good. Don't get me wrong. It was very good, but like it was, it almost, I almost wanted Vandal to step in a little bit more after he had that conversation with both sets of lords um, to have a little bit more of an active hand, but still at the same time. Um, it's yeah. like, I think me and a lot of people were thought the way that this arc was going to play out based on like the summaries for episodes and stuff, like even as each episode was released, made it seem like Zatanna was going to get get the band back together kind of thing was gonna find like every magician they could get and have just like yeah. small army of magicians from dc comics showing up to fight child especially after those the first couple episodes in the arc where like we went and got etrigan and we have the phantom stranger helping and we're gonna go do s- and like her saying i'm gonna go recruit dr fate you guys should go recruit some people and i'm like oh, we're going to get a huge group of magicians together to fight child and this is going to be so cool. And then it's like, oh, that's not what we're doing. Okay, let me switch gears. Um, 
And that's partially on me for like setting my expectations on a specific hope for how this arc would play out, which you can't do in Young Justice. But also like, I feel like I was, I agree. There was a little bit of being like, we have set child up so big and our same five people are still the only people fighting her. But yeah. it was at least a little bit validating that I, way back in the first episode of this arc, went, this is how they're going to defeat Flaw. And that's yep. how they defeated Flaw. Well, Flaw. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's like, I like it. This thing has one weakness. Aim for the what? Mary, stop, stop shooting at its head. Aim for the one weakness. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there there were times where it certainly seemed like all of like the when all of the the power was coalescing. I only really noticed this on a rewatch after trying to see like they are harnessing that power directly at the flaw in flaw for it to do basically nothing. And then, you know, Tracy just being like, that would be some bad luck. Oh, boom. Gotcha. Um, I think the idea is supposed to be that it's it's an internal flaw. So they would have to have. They can't get to it from the outside in. Tracy had to actively go from the inside out to make it work, uh, which is, I think, what they were going for in that scene. Because her whole thing was like, it would be it would be real bad if that crack spread and you broke apart. It would be really, really bad if that's how this happened. Because mm-hmm. um, they kept, I agree. It was just me being like, guys, guys, it's got one... F- F- fire fire at the fire at the there's one there's one problem with it break, the break it at the one part because child made her familiar out of diamond instead of out of cat uh yeah. or bus <laughs> or bus the bus doesn't get broken <laughs> at all impressively the bus stays very intact <laughs> so we have a couple deep we have a couple super deep cuts when yes. you have that scene where um Zatara is being inspired by Superman. Two things is Superman shows up for the first time on um June 1st and it also gives the time code of 1938. Basically referencing back to Action Comic 1 of June 1938 when it was released. The second nice. when it goes when when it cuts back though it says November 28th with the time, you know, timestamp of 1941, where it says that Superman is victorious over mechanical monsters. And I assume what I assume. And of course, my Google foo proves me right that this is actually a nod to the Superman cartoon of the same name that aired on the same date, November 28th, 1941, where he fights mechanical monsters because of. Is. Of course it does. Of course it does. So good. And Claire, I mean, just more Clarion being himself. <laughs> ah, why do I have to do this on two Earths? It's like you, who you did it. You did. Mm, okay. Yep. Oh, I think <laughs> you, he fully remembers. He's like, whose idea was this? Yours. It Clarion. sounds like. I don't know. For me, it sounded almost like he did not. Which well, to be, be fair, totally it might not have been his idea. He just did it. Remember, the light true. sometimes just oh, says, true. "Hey, Clarion, you know what would be fun?" And Clarion goes, "That would be fun," and goes and does <laughs> rutabagas, <laughs> rutabagas, <laughs> which is different. But yes, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, we have the appearance of what appears to be ice and Isis. Like at the at the volcano in the North Pole, which as everyone's getting back on the bus, like there's no way these people did not see them show up. Secondly, they also clearly ha- feel like they have zero responsibility for volcanoes. They're like, look, look, we were assigned one very specific task and it was to deal with child. It is not to deal with volcanoes and we're not going to do it in Sydney and we're not going to do it here in the North Pole. I mean, to be fair, they, both Dr. Fate and then Zatanna keep telling them no we're not yes. helping with the volcanoes i'm just saying, I'm just saying there we have zero responsibility for these okay <laughs> we have one job and we're gonna go do it listen um let's see vandal savage didn't do anything wrong he is just a lord of balance that is definitely a way to look at it i'm gonna sit over here in my corner and be like you know you did try to you know mind control your entire army because you didn't like that they had free will uh and that's its own problem uh and that's its that's its own thing to unpack of like hey vandal savage what's up with your problem with the concept of free will 
Not sure. Not sure. I agree with that whole bit over there with you not a- believing in free will. But no, I, I do feel like like if there were ever someone to be given the title of Lord of Balance, I really do feel like Vandal fits that because his yes. because his plans yes. are so long. So the other part, no, he's he's just terrible, terrible. Things there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but uh, I think yeah. th- I think that's it. Which which means. It's time to crash the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crash in the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. This Crash in the Mode is based on episodes 1 through 13, so the first half of season 4 and all that came before it. So we touched on this briefly uh in our in our feeling the aster and i said no we're saving that till crashing the mode yes but uh in the absolutely wild journey of clarion the magic school bus on his way to quote unquote find heroes one of the places that clarion ends up is the timestamp is just labeled apocalypse one year later after all of the previous ones have been like four years ago three years ago, a year ago, whatever. This one says Apocalypse one year later from our current time where he flies past who I believe, based on my comic knowledge, is Big Barda. And that sure implies a lot all at once, (laughs) very quickly, to the point of all of it being so wrapped up in the fact that you have to notice that timestamp in a sequence that has a lot of timestamps very quickly that I think I missed this the first time I watched through. I was like, okay, now you're in space, cool, whatever, and just kept going because so much is happening so quickly in that sequence. And then rewatching it, I was like, wait a second. Are you implying? Yes, because historically in the comics, Big Barda does switch over to be on the side of good. Yes. Um, and I, I feel like that groundwork is already laid in the previous season as well, her interactions of what Superman did. But then the idea that, like, okay, so wait, what? So did you – I mean, at this point, are you already a hero? Are you on your way to heroing? If you are a hero, what are you doing when you're on Apocalypse? Because you're there and a hero? Um, also, this this leads me to the belief that Granny Goodness is looking at Mary to become one of the new Furies. Is yes. it to replace Big Barda? Is, it, is that the catalyst that makes Big Barda switch over? I mean, so yeah, literally just like, oh, cool. One second of film. Ah, everything you can think of. Yeah, and like, all of the stuff with Mary and the the thing I've been thinking about and I keep forgetting to bring up is like it feels like they're doing kind of the thing from like the Kingdom Come alternate universe thing where Billy Batson's like darkest future timeline is just being Captain Marvel all the time and how they've grafted that on to Mary as kind of, as her thing that she at age eight or whatever was living all of her life as lieutenant uh, and how that is its own thing to unpack and just all of that. It's going to be so interesting. I like all fingers crossed that this storyline continues and we see where this goes because it's a lot to set up and I am very curious. Uh, But yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree with you that it feels like granny goodness who I on the first watch through may have not fully, uh, pieced together was granny goodness. I was like, that sounds like Granny, but how? And then, you know, you go back and you check those credits and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. oh, that's how. Oh, sure okay. enough. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, some of the storylines have also shown like Black Adam being sent into space by the wizard and then showing up like 5,000 years later. And basically the only way to get that to work is to convince him to basically say the word again and then die because now your your host body is 5,000 years old. So the idea of going after Mary, obviously, I would think would be very beneficial to Granny because once you do, and if you can convince her to stay in there and never say it again, then she's just immortal. Yeah, it's wild. Also, I want to see old Billy <laughs> just turning into Shazam, but then like turning back and just being like super old. I, that's funny. <laughs> so... I did reference the other thing that is, uh, so get in losers, we're saving Connor. (laughs) Don't know how, don't know when, just know I've been quietly joking about it (laughs) 
episode since this episode premiered, and it feels very much like it's where we're going. And I've had many thoughts on this and joking <laughs> joking with friends of like, Zatanna's sure going to have a weird message to the team group chat. Uh, <laughs> like, hey, great, great job surviving the end of the world, everybody. Uh, we should get lunch, by the way. Connor is a ghost in space. We should Ooh. talk. Uh, <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and it feels like I, I don't know, but it feels like this is going to be setting up to be kind of one of the big driving forces of the second half of the season. We'll see if that's how it plays out or not. No, I have no idea. I just feel in my heart of hearts, like what's the quickest way to get the whole OG team in that uh, mm. title sequence back together. It's going, Hey, we got to go save Connor. <laughs> but and I related to that. So I said this in a previous Scream Something, and I'm bringing it back because it keeps feeling more and more like it might happen. Like, And it, it totally could not. It could be totally off the mark here. But here is a theory for predicting something from the second half of season four. McGann's going to come back to Earth, as she has been. Uh, and Zatanna's going to explain, hey, I saw Connor's ghost in space. And Artemis is going to bring up, hey, Z. Why not just like call his ghost the way you did with Wally? It really helped me process. And maybe we could, you know, get some information about where Connor is and then go like help him and stuff. Since you have clearly showed me that you can contact spirits of the dead. Uh, And that's how the truth of that whole thing from last season is going to come out. Because if Artemis brings it up as this would be a useful tool to us, Uh Zatanna and and, uh, Zatanna and McGann are going to be like, it's not a useful tool to us because we lied to you. <laughs> yeah. We lied to you to help your mental health. Uh yeah, there there are multiple versions, but every version ends with the truth. <laughs> yeah. Because it's like, okay, so I bring this up, but then like so is the subsequent question like, oh wait, wh- you say we're gonna go save Connor, but then why didn't we save Wally if you were able to do this thing? <laughs> that too is also an option. Also, like, well, so what I, I mean, there's just going to be a, a certain number of discrepancies that are about to happen and the truth is going to be revealed. Um, I don't know how we're going to get there, but I'm pretty confident that we're going to get there. Also, we're mere days away as well, because, yeah. you know, napkin math of when the bus almost hit the ship, we're like three days away from baby showing up on Earth. So as i have also been joking that mcgann is going to show up on earth and be like what do you mean the apocalypse happened while i was gone i was gone for two months yeah jeez guys <laughs> i leave the planet and the world ends again um uh, but yeah, yeah i am sitting back with my giant tub of popcorn like waiting for this for this chaos to unfold uh yep. please and thank you my thought would be the Phantom Zone is just like is where my, my yes. general thought would be. In I don't know much Connor about is. that, to be entirely fair. Everybody keeps bringing it up and I just keep smiling and nodding. Uh, yeah. And, and my hesitancy with bringing it up is just because uh, given what it is, I want to see what Young Justice's version of it would be. Um, so enough. I don't want to I don't want to make too many implications. But that that's just my thought with like adding Granny back in. Um and potential that's that's where my head is also weird everyone's liminal be, this space. this is how wally comes back weird yeah. liminal space in space mm-hmm. i'm assuming yeah, it'll be fine yeah Ooh, is that is that the general vibe of that kind, kind of, of Phantom yeah Zone? yeah weird space that, in space well yeah and then the, the idea was to try and expand it in you know the previous season expand the phantom zone but then it it then it turned into the whole anti-life equation with the other pieces added in but the whole the original like device that she had was to spread the phantom zone oh i forgot about that so much happened in season three that i need to rewatch. uh but yeah so whatever will happen with that we'll see I'm sure sh- I'm sh- if nothing else, I'm sure we're going to pursue whatever's going on with Connor in the second half. Because <laughs> if we didn't, would like that would so. be real weird. Like there's a lot of plot lines going on and it's it would be yeah. real weird if any of them were dropped. But if this one was dropped, it would be really weird. <laughs> what are your crashing the mode thoughts, Neil? Share them. OK, so I don't know how to feel. So like, this is really just I want to talk to you about this yes. and see what you say. Do you feel like that is Tickle? one again or is it 
Teagle 2. I mean, just in the way that like, you know, in the back in the background, you know, when DC labels like the second and the third person that takes on a mantle, oftentimes they'll just put two and three. That's not how they're ever referenced. But I don't know how I feel. Like, is this truly another cat or is it not? Like, it just hurts my head. I hear you. I don't know. And it's the question of like, because that raises quite good. New Teakle, new baby kitten Teakle, looks exactly like old Teakle. She has the same uh-huh. markings and the same collar, which would raise questions of like, has Clarion had other cats before the Teakle that we've seen? Has this maybe happened before? It's treated like it hasn't. And Clarion is clearly very distraught when child uh, hurts Teakle and kills Teakle, as we all were. Um I don't know. Part of me almost feels like it might be the situation of like with baby Bioship where McGann says that baby is both has all of Bioship's memories, but is also her own new Bioship. It almost feels like maybe new kitten Teakle like has the understanding and previous like relationships that previous Teakle had, but is also new cat. Like, I don't, I don't yeah. know. Uh, cause like Clarion can clearly that, understand yeah. her and she clearly already has a bond with Clarion and being a cat person, it is very deeply funny to me of like, how do you get a chaotic, uh, a chaotic magic cat? It's like, they just show up. That's how you know which cat is for you. It picks you. You don't pick the cat. That's not how this works. A strange stray will wander up to your bus mm-hmm. and go, hi, I'm your magical familiar now. And that's how you know. I'm like, yeah, that is how cats work. That's deeply how cats work. First off, I'm a big fan that we're talking about Tico this much. Second off, <laughs> my new my new theory is that yes. I I also think about when Clarion would have showed up in like the timeline of of Earth. Then you also have the version of Tico when he makes her bigger that looks like a saber toothed tiger. Oh yeah, that's a good was point. his was Tico's original form, if you will, when he showed up because you're in these ancient of ancient times, yeah. more akin to the saber toothed tiger, and going the house cat route is just like is the mask if you will and then the saber tooth tiger is not and now you have now you've flipped the script and now you have the domesticated smaller house cat style and then would also still turn into the saber tooth tiger um i don't know but it's i don't know uh, we'll see i love it's it's so just out there also like I didn't Speaking realize I loved like, Teakle this much until this season. Oh, of yeah. Just seeing her be like a cat and be treated like a cat instead of just kind of showing up in the background. I'm like, oh, I am immediately in love with this strange feral cat. She's great. Yeah. I love her. She's not even feral. She's very domesticated. But no, no, I love yes. her. Uh, <laughs> I would like I would like to hug this small kitten that you have uh, adequately established is a vaguely malevolent chaotic force in the universe. And I'm still just like, can I can I give her a pat on the head? Does she like treats? Yeah. Whose lap is she going to sit in? I like her. <laughs> so good. Well, and, and like all Cat of this people. stuff, like <laughs> all of this stuff, like harkens to the idea of both space and time travel. And I don't know what to do with a lot of it because like the kids <laughs> definitely like showed up 10 years earlier and like didn't use that that power for for ill. Not that I think they really would have learned too much on yeah, their travels. That would be my same, argument. Yeah. At the same time, they like but that option is there that time travel in that way exists. And it's very interesting that like you've gone back in time, you've gone forward in time, you've gone to places that we literally can't even have show up on a timestamp. It's just interesting that like, will we see that again? And I think you kind of harken back to also to like the idea of true chaos and true order. The Lords of Order will not do that because it will upset order. And the Lords of Chaos will only do it on a whim. And so they're not going to just do it yeah. when you ask. And like how... People have been asking, like, the thing of Dr. Fate sending the bus back in time. And, like, is that just a thing he can do and stuff? And I personally kind of read it as this is out of place and needs to be put back in its rightful place. View. Like, I don't think that Dr. Fate can just can just time travel for fun. I think he can only do it with stuff that's like, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. swoop send it back to where it's supposed to be kind of thing like i think that that's how i read that power not as just 
cosmic time travel whenever you want and choose not to, but more of a just, no, I can only, this is just, no, put it where it goes. This isn't, this isn't where it stays, man. Yeah. Cause we had time travel before. Cause I mean, that's how the Legion shows up in the first place, but yeah, time, tra- yeah. The introduction of time travel. Very interesting. Cause I don't feel like the, I don't feel in my, the only thing with time travel in media. And I mean, I'm not the person, the person to say it first. I don't know the person to say it last is that the only thing is the only rule is that you follow your own rules. I don't yeah. actually care what your time travel rules are. Just follow them, whatever you set them to be. And thus far, I do not feel like young justice has fallen outside of whatever rules they have. Yeah. And to go back to your thing about like, None of those kids abused the fact that they uh, went 10 years in the future kind of thing. It's the it's the weird thing of like they were stuck on a bus for a couple of hours in a lot of different time periods and learned very little like the, the I feel like the one thing that they could do is like one of them could have been like have a bet with somebody of like in 10 years that that random magician girl that we saw that one time is going to be on the justice league like that's all that's the (laughs) closest information they have or like maybe like doctor i'll bet you dr fate's going to join the justice league sometime like that's it like that's all they really have um i'll bet i'll bet you one million dollars that there's a volcano next to the sydney opera house they never saw that one they never saw that right Well, that in the North Pole, ah, North Pole, North Pole, still a pretty, pretty much a long bet that there would be an active <laughs> volcano in the North Pole. So. Yes, but still, but also they're very young kids and they're a little bit yes. too traumatized from all that. Like, but I do like, I like the acknowledgement from. I, this is kind of going back into stuff from previously, but I love the acknowledgement from Zatanna of actively going, "Hi, you guys just went through something, truly just a lot." Here is a card for someone that can help, and there is no shame in asking for that help and giving us that moment at the end of the episode that goes, yes, these people followed up and like giving us that little bit of closure, one that creates the whole wild thing we talked about with uh, Black Canary of like, you had foreknowledge from 10 years in the future and you never did anything with it because you're good at stuff. Um, But also just like there's the... I almost the watching this the first time I almost cried at her just saying Penny graduates from college next week. She's going to be an engineer. She wants to build safer bridges. Like that's what like oh yeah. stabbed me in the heart in this episode for whatever reason. An episode where 10 million things happen like that was the one where I was like, "Oh, ow. That's perfect and painful and I love it." And just all of that, yeah. It's cool. It's cool. It's good. Like the idea that that's what someone took away from that hi you went 10 years in the future and you almost saw the apocalypse and you came back to your time and went i want to build safer infrastructure and i'm like that's a good kid that's a good kid right there also justice league reserve system did you have something to say about that no it's just interesting because i mean because of what was happening in the people that were involved you know like having both troya and garth involved shows yeah. just how extreme i mean obviously also working in conjunction with like the wizard and phantom stranger and vandal showing up and the red tornado being like oh that's okay hey buddy um <laughs> oh no you took the guy who got me here oh help but we'll fly but it, it was just interesting to see, to see that and i would just absolutely love to see what that looks like um get a ro- get a roster if we could real quick yeah i yeah Which i'd love I know, but I I agree. I would love that because it's that th- it's that question of various people who've retired and stepped away from things who would in an emergency step in or like. I feel like I remember. I don't remember if I said it on the show or if I've just said this to friends. Like the fact that when there's the the whole uh, thing at the very end of season two when they're trying to destroy everything around the world and they get everybody together, how there's part of me that it was always like. Cheshire should be in that lineup. I don't know why. My heart just says so <laughs> that, like, if the apocalypse was happening, she'd step in, kind of thing. And like the idea that a Justice League's reserve system would kind of, would kind of get that of just, we know you don't want to be a full time hero. We know you don't want to be an outsider or on the Justice League or on the team or on any of the groups that we have. But if the apocalypse happens, will you help? <laughs> like, I feel like that's the one question they ask everybody. If the world is literally on fire, would you help us? 
And like two weeks ago, people would have been like, that's a pretty weird specific circumstance. And now they're like, that has happened multiple times now, hasn't it? Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> maybe we should have a system. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. We'll see. Again, it's one of those things, it's, since we are at the mid-season finale, it's just like, we'll see how any of this plays out. Because we don't know. We don't know. But I look forward to seeing all of it. And with all of that out of the way, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us at Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crash in the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And of course, if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., because those are much harder to find. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 